which is a wonderful space that Black Swan have really kindly and sweetly allowed me into for two weeks. Ask people to remove my work and put some money in towards my favourite charity at the moment, which is mine. It makes some kind of sense of what I've done. And it makes me feel all right about, about shifting away my work. I'm going to die soon. I don't want my children to have the burden of thinking, oh, what are we going to do with all this stuff mum spent all her useless life doing? Um, and I, I've been to a few funerals in the last few years, and they've been artists, and their children have exhibited their work, and this, this is a format. What has happened is that their friends have taken away their work and put money in a favourite charity of the corpse. So I thought, that's a really good idea. I'll do it now, while I'm still here. It's really all about getting ready for death. Because um, most of us try to pretend we're never going to die. Which in a way is, is true, because I don't think we do ever die. But there's no doubt about the fact that this body here run, does wear out, you know, like everything. And turns into something else and probably comes alive in some other form. Um, but I'm quite keen to to get myself used to this whole idea that, that this is not going to go on for much longer. So this is, this is a way of preparing myself for the inevitable. This installation for me, um, it reminds me a little bit of the beautiful first film I think I ever saw, which was Over the Rainbow, The Wizard of Oz. I must have been about four or five and it was so magical. You know, as a child when you've never seen a film and then you see a film and it's over the rainbow and all these beautiful colours and, and first it's black and white and then it all becomes colour and it's rainbow and it's full of lovely songs and I thought, actually, I don't want my burial to be a miserable, dark, horrible thing with, you know, black faces and, and things like that. I actually want to be just like this. I want to be lying in a beautiful rainbow place and when I die I want to go over the rainbow. I want to be a rainbow person and, um, and I think I will because that's what I want. So this is not an occasion for misery. It's not an occasion for, for regret at all. It's, it's a joyful thing to be passing over into another state. It's about severance and it, it's also about going away. I painted it when I was, I decided I was going to go away and stay on the Isle of Egg for a while when I was going through one of the transitions in my life and um, I'd succeeded in getting somewhere to live and so, um, so this is me parting and it's also a little bit like a placenta. Um, with with my head going off, it's it's got a lot of meanings. Um, there's the boat, which signifies going away, um, but it also got other symbolism you can pick up if you like. And um, it's also about me entering the menopause, which is a which is a transition where I felt the need to pull away from all the familiar things that I was used to and go to somewhere completely different. channel my libido um, was working with resistant materials and and so that's why I do a lot of lino cuts and cutting into wood and things like that because I've got loads of energy. Now if I could be, if I had been the wife, uh, the first wife of a rampant sultan, you probably wouldn't be any of this work to see at all because I'd be so happily shagging away all day and all night and being fed sweetmeats <laughs> that I wouldn't. My, all my energy would be channeled into sex, but it doesn't happen like that. So instead, it gets channeled into all this sort of stuff. And um, this this one um, I really enjoyed doing because 
it all started off as me dancing in the mornings to African music, which I really like to do as my exercise. And, um, and then one day I thought, oh, I get so energised doing that that I took, put big pieces of cardboard on the side of where I'd been dancing. And as soon as I'd finished dancing, which I do for about an hour, um, usually with nothing on if it wasn't too cold, um, I'd then draw onto these big pieces of cardboard. And I did several drawings, and one of them was this. And so I thought, oh, I like this drawing. I'd done about three or four with charcoal and pastel. Um, why don't I turn it into a print? So I translated it onto lino, stuck the lino onto hardboard, and started um, working on it. This is what's called a reduction print, by the way. And what it means is that it's cut and come away, so there's only one block for all the colours. And you, the first things you cut are what you see are white. And then what you do is you put on the, the lightest colour. You put the very lightest colour on, which is a pale yellow. And um, then you cut away all the things that you want to be the lightest colour and add the next colour, which was sort of orange, this one. And then the next thing you do, you cut away all the things you want to be orange and put the next colour on, which was actually red. And then you cut away some more what you want to stay red and um, put the blue on. And then cut, a, cut again, finally, until all you're, all you're really left with is the darkest lines, um, which are actually sort of blackish. And that's how the print came about. And it's a lot of work, and I decided I wanted to add some texture. So I used caustic soda and blocked out some bits um, and added caustic soda in some places, which is why the surface has been eroded in this. That's why it has this texture. Um, and it's called Dancing by Myself because I realised that I would need to do, you know, I, I had to learn how to manage by myself, you know, and, and um, manage my life and take responsibility for my life and take responsibility for being told all the time that I was crackers and I ought to take medicine and I refused to do it. And, and so I had to find my own way and, and, and I think I have. But I'm not saying I haven't been helped and supported, because of course I have. I've got the most amazing husband, and uh, he's stuck by me for many years. This self-portrait was um, what I did between, um, I think it must be in 19, summer of 1986, when I was just coming up to 40 and when I was about to start my degree at Bristol in fine art. And the summer holiday project was a self-portrait, a uh, life-size self-portrait, and decided that rather than do my whole body, which, be quite, which I wasn't very proud of, um, I'd just do my face from different angles. And then I later discovered that, in fact, there's a painting by um, Van Dyck of Charles I, with three heads, the three different aspects of him. And this is particularly interesting because one of my ancestors, John Oakey, was a signatory. He actually signed the death warrant of Charles I, who then had these heads chopped off. And I'm extremely proud of the fact that I had an ancestor who already then realized how stupid it is to put somebody up on a pedestal like that. <laughs> ecstasy and it's really taken from um, a relief carving by Eric Gill. I decided to spend the whole time drawing that sculpture which, which was, this sort of, was this sort of thing and I did a very careful drawing in my sketchbook and then I went home and um, I didn't do anything, I didn't look at any other work in that exhibition because it took me all the time to do the careful drawing um, I thought it was such a beautiful carving 
and um, so I went back home and I already had this painting which which I'd done it was some dancers that I'd done and I thought mm, I'm a bit tired of that painting I'm going to paint the ecstasy on top and I did and so you've got bits of the other painting coming through in a way that I rather like it's called arthritic dance yeah, this was after I'd moved to Yorkshire and I began to develop arthritis in my fingers. And I thought, oh God, this is awful, you know, am I going to be in a wheelchair? I was quite worried. Um, so I thought, well, before I do go in a wheelchair, I'm going to dance. I dance on my own at home and then I don't have to be embarrassed by all these other lissom creatures. And so, so this was really how I felt and how I feel about my body a lot of the time. And by this time I'd also discovered a better paper to do large prints on, which is Japanese Gampi paper. And the good thing about that is that when you're burnishing, you can actually see what's going on as you burnish, which makes it much easier. And it's a very, very tough, but very thin paper made of some plant fiber, not you know, wood. And I'm also trying to convey the experience of pain, physical pain. Um, and I think that works really well, actually, because you've got jagged shapes, you know, and then you've also got the white pain, um, you know, that, that I, I, I had the inspiration of using white on the final block to put onto it. And that, I feel, works better than any of the other ones I did. In 1981, I was put into a large Victorian mental hospital outside Wells. Um, I was having a big crisis in my life. I wanted to have a fourth child. I was ready for a fourth child. And my husband didn't want any more children. So I imagined one. <laughs> I sort of imagined I was pregnant. and. And, um, and I, I, I really, really lost the plot, you know, in the sense that I went into a world of imagination which became more real to me than the, uh, the world that everybody else was seeing and had this imagined pregnancy. And, and I just entered into a complete world of, of what I wanted to be the truth and what actually wasn't. The story that I'm telling here is the story that I was not able to tell until in 2002 I won a Rutstein Hopkins scholarship to do a master's at Bradford College in printmaking and it was only when I got there all those years later that I felt able to face up to this trauma and it was extraordinary because when I started working on it the, the, the visual memories were so acute that I only had to start drawing and it all came back to me and this is the product and um, and I will show you the pictures and the pictures will tell you probably more than anything I've said and I just like my father in prison camp I realized that the most horrible experiences you ever have in your life if you're fortunate enough to survive can be the greatest redemption So, so this is a picture of me being completely out of my head, out of my mind, out of my tree. And then I thought I was the Virgin Mary. Giving birth with broken glass. The, the, the pain is, is expressed by the broken glass. Um, and that Christ stayed in our farmhouse on his way to Glastonbury with Joseph of Arimathea. So, here's another picture of and did those feet in ancient time with me offering a cup of tea and a Glastonbury thorn. 
I ran wild in the hills, left the children on their own and gave them undercooked boiling fowl to eat. These are all dry point engravings, by the way. So they're all scratched into aluminium. And, um, and then you put ink all over it, remove the ink, soak the paper and put it through a press. And it gives you, it looks like a pen and ink drawing, actually. I thought I was going to Wells for a holiday. Little did I know that drugs are the main form of treatment in mental hospital. Mrs Grimchip, the psychiatrist, didn't know what had hit her. I was sectioned. So here's the moment of triumph. When I kicked the evil empire. I was held down and injected several times with heavy tranquilizers, then taken to a locked ward. Every time I got up and tried to get out that night, I was given another injection. Good, isn't it? <laughs> I think that's my best thing. <laughs> I realised the only way to get out was to be good. So there's me being terribly good, vacuum cleaning, doing as I was told. Like when my dad wanted to escape from prison camp and had planned an escape and then a couple of his mates um, tried to escape but they were caught and brought back into the prison camp and um, buried up to their heads and had their heads chopped off and all the other prisoners were told that would happen to them if they tried to escape. So my father and his friends abandoned their plans to escape and decided to stay where they were and you know make the most of it. Um, and for me I thought well you know it's not a bundle of laughs to have all these injections in your bum and be held down. Um, if I'm going to be here, I'm just going to have to conform and put up with it and that way maybe I'll get out as quickly as possible. Um, so, which in fact turned out to be true. And the other thing of course I had to do, which I didn't want to do, but had to anyway. And to take my medicines. And here comes the nurse who comes around with her trolley. And there are all the other poor inmates who have to take their medication. Some of the other inmates had been there for 30 years. And this, this poor woman, Mary, used to sit in the same place in the corner, like that. People used to put their unwanted relatives away if they were slightly odd or if they'd had an unwanted pregnancy or there were 101 reasons why people used to get rid of their unwanted, usually female, relations. Hazel was another one of the inmates. Hazel had once been a French teacher. Yeah. Mary got into trouble for putting her fingers in the strawberry jam. When the nurse apprehended her, and she was so terrified, she fell onto the floor with her whole face covered in strawberry jam. And there you can see the nurse's feet, the terrifying nurse and the huge, enormous jar of jam. Most people in there had no other home. And now they're all on the streets, those people. I was lucky. I got out after three weeks. And I never went there again. <laughs>
very simple words all you know properly printed hand type set all done like that dry point engravings and um, the first word is just Atlantic because we're setting off um, from the Monarch Isles that are the Outer Hebrides and St Kilda is the very furthest west in the Isle uh, still part of the Hebrides but pretty far out and these are based on the little drawings I did tiny little drawings sitting on the boat as I approached the island and then you could just see them and this is shattered scattered so it's about my state of mind when I'm in a bad way and you can just be in St Kilda and you can just see the prow of the boat and a few birds coming close so you can see birds actually on the water so it's a bit calm uncertain take shape drawing drawing closer and drawing all the time sky high, sheer up, so that's, whew, is it, they're huge, they're enormous, you can't plunge, so that's sort of like me going up, me going down, the water up and down, the cliffs up and down, you know, pull back, right, sort of, um, craggy, soaring, There between these huge rocks. It's the most magnificent thing, honestly. I just swell around the corner, wind dropped into as you're coming into the harbour. Flat car. Anchor dropped. Very beautiful shape when you come in. Quite surprising, really. You don't expect such such a lovely, gentle slope. Solid ground. And this is an extraordinary thing. I I found I found a fogu. I now know it's called a foggy. I didn't know at the time. I found this and it was going into the ground. I had no idea what it was at the time, but I was totally, I was really, really attracted to that as being, that's where I've arrived to. This is a hole into the ground. It's like a tomb, but it's also like a rebirthing, healing place. I subsequently discovered that they're all over the, you know, all over the Celtic world, um, healing, at healing centres and where people were healed were tunnels where you went into the ground at times of transition, at times of difficulty or when you were drunk or you needed to clear out your system or reconsider your life. You went into the ground again, connected with the earth and then came out again when you were okay. And they've got, I saw one in Cornwall, uh, uh, Britain is full of them. Egg has got one apparently, but they got filled in, and here's one in St Kilda, in Hirta. Closed, went a bit closer. Let's see? Lift anchor. Looking out. Life belt and lifeboat. And then the next thing, yeah, life belt.
who make things. I like people to see what I've been doing. And I have been doing this sort of thing for a very long time. I'm not contemporary art. <laughs> I'm old fashioned art. The sort of thing people used to do a hundred years ago when you did useless things like drawing. <laughs> <laughs> So, so I'm extremely happy and contented because here's my opportunity to show people just how brilliant I am and how good I am at what I do, even if they don't think it's worth a shit because you can't use it, you know, I'm not a conceptual artist. Um, and I feel really, really happy to look at all this because I think, well, okay, it may not be particularly useful, but it's bloody good.